Welcome to the Murley End. My name's Mark Machado. I'm joined, as always, by the doyen of Shrugging Cricket, Nick Brooks in South London. And from across the pond, my cousin and top Shrugging Cricket commentator, Dominic Machado. Uh, we have lots to talk about today. We're going to talk about the LPL. We're going to talk about potentially a bit about the future of Test Cricket, because that's come up recently. But before all that, the big breaking news coming out of Colombo in the last kind of 48 hours or so, is that Sanat Jaisuria has been appointed uh, the interim head coach of both the white ball setup and the red ball setup. This is the head of a tour to, in- uh, to India, followed by a test series in England. Um, Nick, I'll go to you first. What was your initial reaction when you heard that it was Sanat who was going to take over the position for, for a, a short time at least? Uh, my initial reaction, I've got to say, was one of... Shock and surprise, really. Uh, We know Sanath's been around the team for a while, but he's got, as far as I'm aware, no head coaching experience. And yeah, this came as a bit of a shot out of the dark. Uh, A lot to unpick and unpack here. Uh, I'm conflicted about the appointment. I can see some good things about it. I can see some bad things about it, but I think it's certainly not a straightforward one. Uh, I think for a team that has had kind of accusations of politics and playing favourites that Sanath maybe isn't necessarily the best PR appointment but then looking at it from the other side of things I mean he's a really inspirational figure right Um, I think you've especially said it Marky that when Sanath says something people within Sri Lanka seem to sit up and take note Uh, obviously what he's done as a batter and as a captain is huge Uh, I think it's also worth mentioning the fact that since you know Dav Watmore took over in 90, 1995 pretty much 30 years ago there have been very few periods where Sri Lankan have been coached by a Sri Lankan uh, so I think that is a good thing uh, and seeing him up against McCullum for the England Sri Lanka series is kind of there's a sense of I don't know a little bit of symmetry there isn't it Basball versus Sandball Sanathball yeah, <laughs> Jaya, Jaya Ball. I don't know. Like, um, Dom, are you are you inspired by the appointment? I'm a little disappointed, to be honest. I think it was in the cards, as we saw in the World Cup. He was the guy who was around the team. He was in the advisory role that Mahela had kind of been in um, in years prior. So, in terms of selecting someone who's close to the players who has an idea of how they've been playing without upsetting too many of the cards. It sort of makes sense. But then, of course, as with most Sri Lanka cricketing decision, there's a lot that doesn't make sense about it. As Nick said, um, no prior coaching experience. His time as a selector was um, clouded by all these accusations of politicking. We all remember Ramath Rambukwela's inclusion in the squad in 2013. Um, and a few years back, he had that two-year suspension from cricket due to the um, refusal to cooperate with the ICC anti-corruption ban. So there's all sorts of things kind of floating around Sanath, and there always have been. Um, so I don't know if, if we're looking for a caretaker appointee for the next couple months. I'm not sure that he's the best um, position for that. I think the other thing to remember is that this is a chance for the the team to hit a reset button, right? They've just had two unsuccessful World Cups. They've got two big white ball series coming up against India. This is a chance to blood new players, give new chances, and kind of start a little bit afresh. Uh, maybe not restart with all the players, but but start afresh. And Sanath just seems like he might go back to the same old policies and procedures that kind of got us to this in the first place. So it's a bit disappointing. Um, It is surprising that he's been named the interim head coach, not only for this India white ball tour, but also for the England red ball tour. Um, Those seem to be two very different assignments. And I'm not sure how much attention can be paid uh, to each of them. If you have to do both. Um, But perhaps Sri Lanka is trying to think long-term and try to think about who they can get, who can, come up with a good plan and a good vision. I don't mind them taking a long time to decide if they land on somebody who has a comprehensive, clear vision for what their future might look like. So, um, you know, 
uninspiring as a choice. There's some reasons to be worried, but Sonat, the player, will always remember fondly. And, you know, if he can maybe imbue some of his freewheeling attitude and, and that uh, low slingy bowling action with those little darters as a, a slow left armor, I, I, I could see someone like doing as well, Olige benefiting hugely from some direct coaching points there. Um, also, I guess it remains to be seen who's going to be appointed underneath him. Who are the going to be the interim batting coaches and bowling coaches to provide support? So we'll see how that shakes out as well. So, so I'm actually, I think I'm a little bit more optimistic than both of you, right? Because I think, you know, a professional sports team, which obviously is what the Shrunken Cricket team is, is to a large degree a marketing and PR exercise, <laughs> right? And I think, you know, after the last two World Cups that we've kind of failed quite dramatically at, I think kind of enthusiasm for the team, in Sri Lanka in particular, I think it's probably a, a low. Um, it's probably probably got about this low during during the kind of Durham escapades and maybe kind of leading into um, in, into COVID. But I think a point in Salah is a kind of easy win in the kind of short term for SLC, right? I mean, I actually reckon he's probably the most loved former player. Um, you know, all shrunkers from all over kind of seem to love him. And, and you know, we, we all fondly remember his exploits. I mean, almost all of us kind of credit him with creating a whole new format of cricket in, in T20 cricket, right? Just from the way he played. And he was instrumental in our greatest moment. Um, so I think it's a good PR and marketing win for SLC. I'm kind of a little bit nervous about the India series because playing India in recent years has caused a lot of pain for this side. I also suspect they're still seeing nervous about that as well. And they probably understand that there'll be a little bit more public sympathy if Salah's in the in the dugout. Because I've always felt like he's the kind of kind of represents the heart and soul of what the Stroker cricket team stands for, right? Um obviously he's not he is not without sin, but he always seems to be the man at the centre of a lot of a lot of what happens, not just in cricket and Lanka. You know, he, he's what helped in various other projects as well over the years as well. And so I think maybe that's why they came to this conclusion that giving him the the role for a few series would, would be a good one. I'm interested because I know he's he's not overly fond of doing interviews in English. Um, I believe, and obviously, when he comes to England, he'll he'll have to talk to the press at some point. I'd imagine. Um, I'm interested to see what his Red Bull team looks like. Um, you know how how it plays because we can, you know, obviously, you can draw comparisons to uh, to Bas McCullum and and, and Basball, but actually, I think there there was a process behind the way England concluded got to that conclusion of playing like that, and I actually think Shrunker Cricket's Red Bull t- side has a way of playing as well, right? Um, and it wouldn't necessarily apply, you know, appeal to all our strengths if we ended up trying to play cricket in that, or Red Bull cricket in that manner, right? And I do think that the Red Bull team's quite good. I also think, I'm not sure how much kind of input you can have in a, in a Red Bull setup like Sri Lanka because you look at that squad and most of those players are quite established test players now at this point in the kind of back at, you know, twilight of their career. So you, I can't see him coming in and changing things too, too dramatically in, in that Red Bull team. But, you know, I think he's, he's one of Sri Lanka's great winners, right? So maybe he could kind of push us over, over the edge and over the corner. But, you know, I agree with what both of you have said in terms of we need a longer vision here, right? I, 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 I can't imagine Salah's going to take us to a World Cup. I can't imagine he, at this point in his life, that he wants to be the guy who takes Sri Lanka to a World Cup. But maybe, you know, a few weeks ago, I, I said Ravi Shastri should get the job and they should spend all the money. Maybe he is Sri Lanka's Ravi Shastri. I don't know, right? Maybe he's just going to make the players feel good about themselves and 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 go out there and and uh, and, and defeat all, all in front of them. Yeah, I think... It's a good point about him being one of Sri Lanka's great winners, Marky. And I think it's worth touching on the fact that before 96 came along, he was kind of one of Sri Lanka's great losers for a long time, right? He'd been in the side since the early 90s and not 
done anything really, you know, batting in the lower middle order, kind of contributing more with the ball than with the bat. And then he managed to completely <coughs> turn his career around. And that second half of the 90s absolutely dominated the international scene. And I think one thing that you can say about Chris Silverwood, which I don't necessarily think is his fault, is that he seemed to struggle to inspire confidence from within the squad and to get the best out of the players. I think we saw that really play out uh, emphatically during the last two World Cups. And maybe that's somewhere where Sanath will have more success. I think having a head coach who speaks singular is also quite an important factor um, and it just breaks down those potential communication barriers which exist with an overseas coach and yeah no I can see some good things about this I do just think that he comes with a bit of political baggage as Dom touched on uh, but it's interesting because he, I know he's been given the tag of interim caretaker but I do feel now that he's in the role that it's kind of his job to lose and that if the next couple of series against India and England go well or go all right because expectations are pretty low for both of those series that we could find ourselves in a situation where Sanath is in this role on a slightly longer term basis I don't know if you guys agree yeah well I think the the other thing that's worth considering right is SLC find it really hard to recruit for this role they've got a bit of a bad reputation when it comes to paying people on time right and also yeah. the amount of control that people have over select uh squads and, and who should play when so some yeah, of the, I think, the top top coaches are, are kind of put off by that yeah international um, reputation of slc is low right and we saw it with mickey leaving to go to derbyshire who are probably you know one of the smaller counties and they've had a lot of issues with foreign coaches so yeah you it's recruitment's not going to be easy yeah i i guess the thing that i would i would add on to that is i think slc needs to be clear about what its vision is like, I don't think changing a head coach is just all of a sudden going to make us competitive against India and England, right? I hope they realize and they, they can sit back and, and, and look at it from the vantage point of, yes, we have talented players. Yes, we've made strides, but we need a vision. We can't just hope that we can, we're going to change one or two things and all of a sudden we're going to be best in the world. That, that doesn't happen, right? There's too much thinking. There's too much development that's going on in cricket right now to reasonably expect that. And um, I guess I'm curious what, what both of you think about this, but I'm not sure that it'll be as difficult as we think to find a good head coach, right? Because Mike Hessen, who is really highly rated as head coach, just took the Pakistan job. And I obviously Pakistan might be a little bit more high profile than Sri Lanka, but it certainly is just as volatile as Sri Lanka is from a political point of view, from a player management point of view. Um, you know, we've heard Mickey talk about this as well um so i'm curious to see who they who they're going to interview and what type of coach they'll want to get whether they'll want someone on the younger side of things who has a vision um or whether they'll want to go for sort of an older steady hand there, there was a period and obviously we're, we're talking about with Shlunker, that kind of great white ball team but it became a bit of a breeding ground for coaches who wanted to kind of you know push up the the ladder it was the kind of dortmund to uh, like you know, the the kind of Jurgen Klopp journey, wasn't it? It was like where you, where you got off, you got a bit of a reputation, and people wanted to have a look at you, but no one quite wanted to take the chance. You kind of came in, came and took the role, and then if you did well, you you'd get jobs in other places. I'm always a bit dubious though about how much, particularly the longer the format is, is how much input coaches can actually have. Right? I always think it's you know by the time a player's got to the stage within a red ball setup. Or even now, increasingly, the white ball set up. That you, you get them for, what, a few days before the uh, series starts. You're not going to change the technique or anything, right? It's it's almost like a psychological role, right? You could have strategy for the way they play, but to a degree, you, you're kind of hamstrung with the skill set that is in your squad, right? You suddenly, you know... I mean, I say this, Sri Lanka are, are a team that would decide that they're going to, you know put an opener to bat at eight or something nuts <laughs> like that. But like realistically, you can't really be doing that and expecting it to kind of come off every time, right? Like you you, you have the tools that are created by your domestic system and then you gotta gotta kind of slot that in, right? Um I don't know what but you guys think about that. I think it can vary from setup to setup as well, and that you get teams that are very much captains' teams, like Arjuna Sri Lanka, and then other teams yeah. where the coach takes a more 
dominant kind of driving role. And I think that one thing that we can say about the whole Silverwood tenure is that it never seemed especially clear who was steering the ship, right? Uh, Mahela was like lurking in the background for a lot of it. Silverwood was a fairly unexperienced coach with not that much, um, well, like knowledge or experience of South Asia. And then we had like a psych- captain cycling out. But here at the moment, you've got two young or three young, pretty inexperienced captains and I think it's clear that Sanath is going to be steering this ship, right? And that he'll be directing uh, strategy and policy around this team. And yeah, so I, I mean, that's one thing. So, so, so what, do you, what, what do you think from, from the kind of mid-90s side that won the World Cup, Nick, that Sanath could kind of bring into this setup that isn't quite there yet? Uh, I think confidence. I think like backing your skills, playing your own way, uh, sticking to your game under pressure. I mean, we've talked about a lot on this podcast, right? That when something goes wrong in Sri Lanka matches, there don't seem to be a lot of guys who are ready to stand up and say, I'm going to be the one to stop yeah. this crisis. It looks like there's a kind of rabbit in the headlights domino effect where things just get worse and worse. Uh, and, you know, as I said 20 minutes ago, Sana failed a lot in the early part of his ODI career and then found a way. And I do think that a lot of Sri Lanka's problems over the last 18 months have stemmed from mentality, have stemmed from a lack of confidence and self-belief. And that's something that when Dav Watmore came in, he was able to uh, change very quickly. And so I wonder if Sanath can do something similar mm. uh, by, yeah, just, um, you know, Saying to the, I, th- the, I think the value of having a guy like Jaya Saria saying to, you know, a young cricketer who doesn't have much experience, I believe in you. I've seen it all. I know you can yeah. do this. All you need to do is go out and execute. I think that can actually have quite a profound impact and more of an impact than we would sort of, than we necessarily realize as outsiders. I agree. Don't with you re- that. Yeah, okay. I was going to say, uh, just, just one thing to, to add. I do think that there's some pressure, right? Um, one thing we see on social media is, oh, well, look at the look at the bygone days of Sri Lanka cricket, right? From 1996 to 2014, we were world beaters. We were best in the world. Our players were so um, always put up huge performances. Um, they were morally superior. They were, you know, all, all these kind of things. And if you actually drill in and look at the numbers, yes, they were a good team, but they weren't as good as sometimes we imagine it in our mind's eye, right? They lost a lot of games. They lost games in embarrassing fashion. Uh, Sanath has the career record for Ducks, right? Um, These great players have been through failures. So I think one of the things that worries me is that um, these players will look at Sanath and think, I'm playing for my idol. I've got to perform perfectly. When in reality, someone like Sanath had time to fail had time to get better, as Nick said, right? Had a career where, you know, he starts in the in the lower order and is bo- and more of a bowler than a batter and then magically finds his role, right? Is there, we, we need someone to create an opportunity for our players to grow like that. And I'm wondering if the pressure of the past, um, which I think weighs heavily on Sri Lankan players, right? Every time we go into a tournament, Sri Lanka does well in knockout tournaments. Oh, well, we have to play our unique brand of cricket. Whether that weighs, more, whether that's going to weigh even more heavily on the side um, with Sunneth at the helm. Guys, before we go on, can I just remind you, if you're watching or you, on YouTube or if you're listening to the podcast app, you've got to subscribe. Um, hit that follow button, hit the subscribe button. Uh, we need all your help and all your support to grow this channel and uh, bring you more great content as as we get bigger and scale up. Uh, one day we intend to try and win a Cricket World Cup. I don't know how a podcast will do that, but we'll give it a go. And because I'm shrunken, I believe that can happen. Um, do you, do, Nick, you brought up Dav Watmore over there. He's living back in Sri Lanka now and he's very up for working. Do you think he might end up <laughs> in the setup somewhere? Kind of, what, I, a third or fourth stint? Yeah, I hope so. I think that having him in a kind of advisory role can only do good things. Uh, He seems like a really nice guy, Dav, from what I've heard and seen. And 
he had such a positive impact when he came first and second time around. Uh, I think, you know, obviously <laughs> the 90s were a very different time, but you look at the way the things that he was able to implement very quickly, you know, uh, like yeah. fitness, fielding, uh, making the team feel more professional. He, I think he had that understanding that the little things can add up to big gains. And I think a voice like him around the side at the moment would be a really good thing. Yeah, I, I, I don't think SLC own a pair of calipers at the moment. So <laughs> maybe he could get, get on the flight to India with, with his own pair. I don't know. Um, because Dom, you brought up the point is that, you know, who else is in this setup? SLC employ a whole range of coaches that they can, yeah. they can get involved in, right? Uh, you mentioned Lasseth Malinga uh, in one of the pods we did last week, I think, as a potential head coach. And in, a, in my mind, Lasseth's like the role that he plays in, in wider shrunken society for casual cricket fans. It's kind of the opposite of where Sameth is, right? Yeah. Uh, if, if you know, Sam is everyone's favorite, Lasseth, for whatever reason, seems to be you know the the, the least favorite child. <laughs> um, even though you know he, he's a player that you kind of associate with winning and wickets as well, but I do kind of you know, as soon as you said it, I do kind of hope that they could bring in someone like him, you know, a character like him who can kind of get a little bit more out of the players, especially because. Hopefully, at least for that India series, we'll look to be kind of leaning into the slingers a little bit, don't we? Yeah, I think that would be uh, huge. And I mean, he's worked with uh, Tushara at Mumbai. He's worked with Patarana on his own. His knowledge of the game and his knowledge of modern T20 cricket is far superior to any other bowler in Sri Lankan history, right? There's so much that he can pass on. And he's he's much beloved by the players currently. I know that they, they viewed him as very much an uncle-type figure who looked after them, who taught them so much about the game. And I think on the sidelines, he could be, right, if we're imagining Sanath is rejuvenating the team by bringing good old memories back, someone like Malinga could very much do the same. I think it also is interesting, and maybe we should talk about this a little bit, is um, the fact that they may be moving on from some of the more senior players in white ball cricket. Um because effective with the announcement of Sanath Jayasuriya's um, naming as interim coach, SLC has announced that a few players are going to be headed to the UK early to practice their, their red ball game. It's, it's interesting, right? Because what, what, who we're basically talking about here is Angelo Matthews, right? So he's going to come over to England earlier. Angelo, if you want to come in the early end to sit down interview with us, we're more than happy to go to any, like me and Nick will take to any Sri Lankan restaurant or non-Sri Lankan restaurant you want in London, apart from the one that's a thousand pounds ahead, we can't afford that. <laughs> uh, um, but yeah, if, you, if you're listening, Angelo, you want to come on while you're in the UK, we'd love to get you on, not just him, any any Sri Lankan player, anyone who knows Sri Lankan players, you, you're all more than welcome to come on. And I'm sure we can find something to talk about and some uh, <laughs> lamb cutlet, uh, uh, lamb rolls or, or fish cutlets to eat as well. Um, I I don't think that announcement necessarily signals the end of Angelo Matthews as a white ball player, at least not in Angelo's head. I think it just means that they are quite keen. There is a bunch of players in our Red Bull setup who are, who have personal goals they want to achieve and will sacrifice playing white ball games if there's a Red Bull tournament uh, series on the horizon in which they can get closer to those goals. Nick, you kind of got the cast of vote here. Do you think Angelo's done as a white ball cricketer for Sri Lanka? Uh, I think that he's done for now. I don't think we'll <laughs> see him play an ODI or T20 in the next, say, three to six months, but he's the cat with 25 lives, right? And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if, yeah, mid-2025, things are going bad and we suddenly get Angelo slotted back in to the side, not having the worst LPL while we're no. at it. I mean, uh, and, you know, age is only a number and if he thinks he could still contribute, I wouldn't rule him out having one more comeback. And after all, I mean, Sanath Jayasuri is the man who had about 24 retirements. So if there was ever a tenure for, um, <laughs> yeah, Returns it seems glory. like, yeah. yeah. Um, under Jaya Surya seems like it could be a time when we get another comeback or two. Chandamal back in the T20 side 
Malinga coming out of retirement, don't rule it off. <laughs> What's Chief and Mentis up to these days? <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking, of course. Um, I Yeah, I also think with that World Cup at home, I think that's a pretty big carrot, right? And Nick, as you say, his LPL is going all right, isn't it? So I don't think we should jump to a conclusion about that is SLC retiring some of the older players here. Well, well, okay. The one counter argument I'll give is they sent Nishan Madushka, who has been in very good white ball form over for the red ball side. So I think that means he's not in contention for consideration. I, I wouldn't, I, I, again, I'm not ruling Angelo out of white ball cricket forever is just, just odds on a bad decision. But I think for the next three to six months, he's probably done. There's no point in him playing this India series against probably India's next generation of stars. I won't call them a B team because they're very, very good. So the players that are coming over to England um, in the first week of August are Dimith, which makes sense because he just plays test cricket. Chandamal, Vishva, who's here already, I think. Uh, or not, I think he is here already playing yeah. for Yorkshire. Uh, uh, Laru Kumara, Nisha Madushka, uh, Ravish Mendes, Prabhacha Surya, and Angela Matthews. Um, pr- I don't know if Prabha- I'd imagine someone like Prabhacha Surya has probably played club cricket in England. I don't, I don't well, know. Yeah. I would have thought um, so at some stage. I don't know that for sure, but he just seems like the kind of guy who would have had a solid stint in English club cricket. Apparently yeah, I, I also... Yeah, he apparently okay. has never played, never played English cr- club cricket. Never played oh, out wow. in Malacca, actually. Oh, wow. wow. Apart from New Zealand. That's the one uh, place he's, he's gone now, right? With Sri Lanka, yeah. since he's broken. Um, so, but I want I would to know. I think it's great that they send them over for eight, like th- this eight over a few weeks before. But like, what are they doing with them? They can't be all getting county contracts. In fact, there's no... Test yeah. championship to play that. Sorry, county championship to play then. So are they going to drop them into into club cricket? I want to know who's playing for Stanmore. They always get the best ranking players. <laughs> Arab into the silver played a couple of seasons there. Um, they must be, I imagine, put them into Lancashire leagues, Middlesex, and Surrey leagues, right? Um, I, yeah, yeah, you'd have thought so. Maybe a um, like inter squad match with some of the under nineteens if they're still around. I don't know if that yeah. overlaps at all. I think the under 19s are going back at the end of this week is my understanding but I they have a test wrong. they got a te- they started their the first test right today yeah. started today, today right yeah yeah, yeah. so I, I think they they're probably heading back at kind of the back end of this week I'd imagine um so yeah I wonder what I wonder what they're gonna do with them um I mean Dimuth's played County uh, cricket before, yeah. though he, I think he only ended up playing two games for Yorkshire during COVID. Right? Um, has Angelo played county cricket before? I can't remember. I feel like he has, but I, I can't remember. recall him having done so. It seems strange that he wouldn't have done, right? Yeah, it seems really strange that he wouldn't have done. But he's he also is the most capped uh, uh, even in his prime. He never got a break from international cricket. He was just playing game after game after game. Yeah, I'm not seeing a yeah. county on his um, yeah. cricket info. Because um, you would have thought, actually, think about it, Chandabal and Matthews would be two perfect players of county cricket. Because um, I don't think Chandabal's played county cricket either, has he? No, not as um, far as I can recall. Yeah. Anyway, um, they're going to be over. Presumably, there's a plan uh, for how they're going to get into the best shape, um, be best prepared. I'm really excited about it because I do keep thinking if the weather's good and if our bowlers can get to grips with what the ball does in England, I think it's a it, you know it's it's not as clear cut who can win this series as many England fans would lead you to believe. Um, Jimmy's I'm, I'm, his last test too, right? Who's going to take the wickets? Who's going to take the wickets for England? Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of surprised at that, actually. I mean, I know this isn't about the England team, but I think Jimmy would have actually caused our batters <laughs> a lot of problems. Is, um, is, isn't his career best figures against Sri Lanka in, in test cricket? 10 for 45 or something like that? 
Yeah, and he had a monster spell the other day, the first time he's bowled in a while, and I think he yeah. took, what, seven for not very many. Uh, yeah. And they've, Ollie Robinson's been dropped, so there um, is no Mark Wood, no Joffre, so suddenly a bit of a kind of seam bowling chasm and some inexperienced guys having to stand up and carry that attack. It could be interesting. Yeah. Um, if Dimuth, Chandy and, and Angelo can can just stick about at the crease, I think it could cause a real headache for the England team because, you know, as this side was, what, one game away from getting to the World Test Championship last year? And yeah. And they're, they're an experienced side. They haven't lost anyone since then. Yeah. And, um, and Chandy and Matthews both have hundreds in England. Yeah. Multiple. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, was Chandy's first 100 was in England, wasn't it? His uh, first he definitely ODI 100. Is, yeah, yeah. Uh, Lords, right? Yeah. Yeah. Where, he, where, where, where Matthews refused to take singles so that, so that Chandy <laughs> could get his 100. And Dilsa what a guy is, Angelo yeah, is. Yeah. What Dilsa a guy Angelo is. happy about that, but... Yeah. Um, um, but should yeah. we move on to... Oh, go on. No, I was just going to say, Chandy and Angie both having hundreds at Lords. It's like that's a nice little booster going into that yeah. first test there. And uh, yeah, you've, I, I feel like this team should come with hopefully not that rabbit in the headlights feel, and they'll have a bit of confidence about. Yeah, them. yeah, absolutely. And it's, um, it's I think Nick, me, me and you are going to go to that first. I think the first test is at Old Trafford, isn't it? Oh, the first Old one's Trafford. Old Trafford, isn't it? But yeah, first two yeah. I'm definitely in for, and. Uh, Third one, I think I'm away, but I might try and get back for the last day. Uh, but I've got a friend who's got some spare tickets going. If anyone's listening and they want them, hit us up. <laughs> that, that's very optimistic that you think that England will be able to drag it out to five days before they lose. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, so the point is, though, if, if you watch or listen or in any way interact with the early end and see us around, do say hello at any of the test matches. We'd love to have a chat with you. Um, and see see you guys if you're going. Uh, should we move on and talk about the LPL because that has been kind of carrying on at at pace. Um, the biggest story of the LPL isn't what's happened in terms of cricket wise, but it's more uh, s- s- that a T20 international captain refuses to shake a hand of his. I want to say former teammate. Um, this is where Pasaranga didn't shake Chandy's hand. Um, it, it, it compounded a bad day for um, uh, not Chandy Charmaka's hand. Um, it compounded a bad day for uh, Charmaka because he also had that catch uh-huh. not given, which was absolutely fantastic. Um, Dom, can you explain a little bit because I've failed to totally what actually happened and what the kind of fallout has been since around this handshake incident? Yeah, um, well, I'll I'll do my best to to try to explain it. Well, the so there's video of Candy coming out and, and trying to shake hands with Colombo, right? And uh, they show Hasaranga shaking hands, and then he clearly pulls his hand away as Chamaka's about to shake hands with him. And then Chamaka gives him a look back um, as if to say, come on, man, what what's going on here? But um, I think what... What is really, you know, maybe it's the heat of the moment. Maybe it's just frustration. Maybe there was something in the game that happened. But for social media has blown it up because there have been all sorts of rumors about when Indu's control of the T20 team, does he like Shamika? Are there frustrations with him? And this kind of just added another plot point to it, right? Um, What's behind it? We can't really say. There's all sorts of rumors swirling about but it seems pretty clear that there is definitely some animosity to it. And I think one thing that's uncomfortable is Chamaka has been having a pretty good um, tournament. He's been hitting the ball well. He's uh, shown some good power down the ground, um, hitting big sixes. His bowling hasn't been particularly great, but then again, no Sri Lankan seamer has um, sort of showered themselves in in glory there, but he's looked really, really good when he's had to bat. And obviously we saw his brilliant catch that he made the other day and it shows what he can add to the team. He's the kind of guy who you want batting at seven or eight in your squad. But if when Indu is going to have a, I'm not going to play with Shanika 
clause, then that makes things really, really difficult for the selection, right? Chana, or, um, sorry, Chamaka clause. Um, because Chamaka is a bowling all-rounder who bowls good pace, and I've always thought of him as a bowler first, but now that he's added the power arsenal in, he's someone who is going to be incredibly valuable to Sri Lanka going forward in the white ball format. So we're going to have to see how this frustration boils and bubbles over into selection for the next series. Um, there's kind of four players who are kind of putting their hands up, I think, a little bit for selection here, who've not had the best time recently in Shrunken Colours. That is Dustin Sharnaker, who is hitting the ball at an incredible uh, strike rate, which is kind of what we all thought he was good at, but he kind of just has fallen terribly out of form for Sri Lanka recently in the last kind of year or so. Charmka is the other player who's been in pretty good form. The other two aren't necessarily striking it as quickly as those two, but it's Avishka who's kind of missed a LPL. I think he's been christened on um, or baptised by uh, social media. And KJP as well, who are both in incredible touches. Off those four... Which of them, Nick, are making it into Salah's first squad for the India series? <laughs> uh, I think Avishka has to be in there. Um, he's got 350s in four innings, right? And just looks to be bursting with confidence. I feel like he's hitting the ball harder than we've seen in the past. Uh, the way he's dealing with spin and pace, both sides of the wicket, sweeping really confidently against the spinners, but also looking good when width is on offer. But um, yeah, as Dom said, I've been impressed with Charmika's batting and he's athletic in the field. He's striking 200 plus, hasn't done a lot with the ball. Uh, and as you touch on, Mark, he Sharnak has been in really good form with both bat and ball, right? He's been bowling some useful spells as well, uh, which is a sort of aspect of his game, which I think we'd kind of thought had fallen by the wayside and that he couldn't be trusted to take on overs. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if Charmika doesn't make that squad, but I I feel like this whole incident is just a PR loss for Hasaranga. And mm -hmm. off the back of what we saw at the World Cup, it's kind of like the last thing he needed. And it's, I don't know the ins and outs of it. It's natural that you don't get on with some people that maybe you think someone's a bit of a dick. But when you're the national captain and they're already rumblings of agendas and politicking around the side you know you've got to maintain an air of impartiality and i think the last thing that sri lanka needs now is for charmika to go on a good run through the rest of the lpl him not to be in the squad and then people to come up and say oh has he not been picked because he doesn't get on with yeah. one Hindu? like rather the, whereas i think there are perfectly legitimate cricketing grounds that he was dropped and hasn't been in recent squads so i mean uh, yeah i think the whole thing is just a bit of an unfortunate incident. Uh, and But yeah, we'll see how it plays out because I've been impressed with the way he's finishing innings. And that's something that Sri Lanka's lacked, right? And so, you know, those guys are pretty much gold dust. So yeah, really interesting to see how that Charmika story develops over the next few weeks. We should also just add to that as well that uh, Wadi's candy side is kind of struggling a little bit as well to win matches. Massively. Um so they, if PR is exactly the right phrase and word for it, isn't it? Because he's just not winning hearts and minds at the moment. When he, you know, you, you kind of rewind to to when he was injured, and you kind of feel like <coughs> he was our great hope. And now, in a quite a short period of time, he's, he seems to be kind of turning people off him. Um, I still believe, though. Like, we still I believe. Still believe. I, we, we, we believe. Um, uh, do you have anything, anything else that we need to mention from the LPL, do you think? Yeah, I was going to say, so if you check Crick Info's uh, most valuable player of the series for uh, the LPL, it's none, under, none other than Wanindu Hasaranga, um, whose impact is... Their, their impact number is 71 per match, and that's leading the league ahead of Shadab, ahead of Avishka. Um, I want to say one thing about Avishka that I noticed. So the first couple games, he kind of bullied the uh, the second-tier bowlers a bit, so he smashed around Akila Dunanjaya, and he smashed around uh, Chimindu uh, Kramasinghe. 
But this last match, he took uh, the Fizz for runs. He took Nuan Tushara for runs. So we've been talking about how he's a confidence player. And we can see how um, having this good run of form is helping his confidence against better players. Um, because I think, Mark, you had asked last time, was it a gap in bowling quality? And, you know, part of us wants to believe, okay, maybe it is about gap in bowling quality. But when you see him take on the likes of the Fizz and Nuan Tushara, you know that he can do it against anybody. And he's shown that in the past. So we need to get him on that confidence train. Um, and I think the best thing we can do is to back him. I think Chamika may make the ODI squad, but not the T20 squad. I think that might be the kind of solution they come to. Um, and then the only other, oh, the two other people I'll mention briefly, um, nothing surprising here. Patham Nisanka continues to go from strength to strength. Uh, it's so, so great to see. I feel like we just need to shout him out every time uh, he's there. We're seeing um, Matisha Patirana had a huge spell the other day where he took four wickets and totally destroyed. Um, who was it? Uh, uh, Candy. Candy, yeah. They were in good position to chase. And yeah, he took out. Um, Matthew Shataka and Hasaranga, and it just tells you what a match winner that guy is. Um, we love to say it. We'll be following it, continuing to follow the LPL, the, the world's premier T20 tournament. Go, sorry, Nick. Before one we... more, one more LPL point from me before we move on is some of the players who are sitting out. Uh, like you know, we've seen the likes of. Nishan Madushka, Cruz Pule, Chevron Daniel, Dan and Jai Lakshan, all not finding places in teams. I think there's quite a lot of other established names who aren't getting picked up. And so my point is really just that I think LPL is ready for a sixth franchise okay. if uh, if we can find a decent stable owner. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it would be great if this expanded to a six team tournament. And I mean, also it's worth mentioning that it's being played at a really difficult time to attract overseas yeah. quality with, you know, MLC going on the English County season in full swing. Uh, and so I just think, yeah, that next year the LPL should be a six team tournament. I think it should move slightly later in the year to kind of like, I think October would seem an ideal slot when there's not that much other cricket going on. They could draw more players from England. They'd have a better... Um, What's more, the weather more... like in October, though? Is yeah, I guess that could rain. that could be an issue. It's rainy. Um, yeah. I, I think they should play it just in the weeks before the IPL starts because I think that it's, it's a false nursery into the IPL... That the would first make thing that will happen is players who, who don't have IPL contracts who want to showcase their talents will come in straight away. So if you played it between ILT20 and IPL, I think ILT20 finishes after the SA20, um, then that would be a good shot window into the IPL. And yeah, that's when yeah. I, I think kind of might be the optimum time to play it. Now, I, can obviously, get on, it's worth, I can get on board with that. Yeah, um, it's worth I, yeah, I think that. Current window sucks. Uh, yeah, and at Murley Ed, we believe the LPL is bigger than the uh, IPL. Just so you know. <laughs> not bigger, better, 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 uh, better. It's an untangible thing; you can't measure that. Uh, but we know, we know. Um, guys, should we finish on talking about the future of Test cricket? Because there was a big old conference last week in, in the UK in at Lords, obviously, uh, <laughs> where they were talking about the kind of future of cricket, what might happen. I'm just getting the quotes up. Um, and by the sounds of it, no one came away from it. It sounded particularly like there was a new plan to save it. There's all sorts of reports that Test cricket might eventually dwindle to six teams. Sagakara was there. I don't know who who, who else with a shrunken slide was there. I don't have a list. It's kind of my understanding is it's kind of like a Davos for <laughs> for cricket. Uh, uh, just all sorts of people were there. I mean, I'm just going to say this buried in 45 minutes into a shrunken cricket podcast. Like I've watched the test as in the series on Amazon about the Australian uh, cricket team and. I have seen what Justin Langer was like in a change room, according to that game. Why you think any that man would have any idea of how to save cricket is beyond <laughs> me, considering that cricket's problem isn't the way the game was played. 
but it's the marketing and the finances of it and the fact that the, it can't organize itself. So I'm also a bit, not just Justin Langer, there's a few other people whose names are on that list where I'm like, these people won't possibly add anything. They've got nothing to add to this conversation. Um, but anyway, rant over. Um, apparently, there was a quote say, where Sanger said, I'll feel sad, but there's nothing much I can do about it when he was asked about what would happen if Sri Lanka were kind of excluded from playing test cricket. I mean, Dom, I, I think some people online have got quite upset by these comments, but I kind of think I agree with him. I mean, what do you want Kumar Sankar to do if the if the finances start to fall away? Well, I mean, how well, much can he possibly charge for a crab at his restaurant that can save <laughs> test cricket? Look, look, I think you know we've all heard your your take on this, Mark. Um, so we know where you stand, but. I think if there's one Sri Lankan cricketer who can use the bully pulpit a bit and say, you know, reducing test cricket to six teams, and we know who those six teams probably are going to be, right, already is unfair, right? If this was like a relegation or a promotion thing, okay, then that's one thing, right? Um, I remember Michael Holding saying in 2018, even if England are relegated to the second division of of uh, test cricket, they won't go, right? So I was expecting Sangakara to talk about the importance of the game, the importance of playing test cricket to Sri Lanka, right? That young boys and girls, when they're playing, you know, when they play in the backyard, are thinking of playing test cricket, right? When they're playing for their schools, they're thinking of playing, they're playing two and three day games, right? They're not playing 20 over games. And that, um, if it becomes the the battleground of the privileged, what meaning does that have? I think there needs to be more context added. I don't mind if there's more divisions or tiering or whatnot based on performance, but I was a little disappointed in Sangha not following the sort of Arjuna Mahela route and saying, you know what? We have played a proud part in test cricket. We're here to stay and you can't push us off. Um, and if you, you know, we're, we're not going to participate in other forms of cricket. If you're going to hog all these revenues and finances and make it only plausible for a few teams to play. Nick. Yeah, I totally, totally agree with Dom. I was really disappointed with the messaging from Sango on this, uh, to say like, what can I do about it? It's like, mate, you were literally the president of the MCC. Yeah. You're one of the only Sri Lankan people who, in an international context, whose words actually carry weight and impact. And for you to just say like, oh, I've done my bit and shrug my shoulders. It, for me, I, it's just really disappointing. And I think the like, you know, Sri Lanka worked so hard for generations to get test status and, it, and cricket means so much to the island. I think the the messaging has to be like, look at all the good days Sri Lanka have given good given test cricket. Look at how much more of a colourful, vibrant place the game is with different countries, different cultures playing it in a different way. And I mean, I think that a lot of people agree that cricket would be or test cricket would be a poorer, more boring place if it's just England, India, Australia playing a non-stop tri-series. And yeah, I don't know. I, I, I do understand where Sang is coming from, but I think that he's one of the few people who are in a position where they can really promote Sri Lanka, where they can tug at the international community's heartstrings a little bit. And I would have liked to see him doing that rather than just the full, like, pfft, it is what it is. What are you going to tell people when they look at, oh, who's the all-time leading test cricketer, uh, all-time leading test, uh, sorry, wicket taker in test cricket? And they look at Murley and they're like, oh, Sri Lanka doesn't play test cricket. Who is the third all-time leading test run scorer, right? Sangakara. Sri Lanka doesn't play test cricket, you know. So, that's... so, so, so I, can't, I can't, the reason why I think I've got empathy for for Sanger's point of view is right is because I just feel like it's just a constant fight to keep this flipping format alive. And actually, 
like you know i get emotional hearing you guys you know i'm nearly crying listening to, to, to what you guys were saying about how much cricket means to shrunk and you think about all the great moments that we've had playing test cricket over the years and you think about how, how important cricket is but i also think that cricket has kind of moved on as well and it's like it's it's just Test cricket just feels so left behind. Why does it feel like a constant struggle to keep this format on 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 the go? Like our players are in such high demand in in T Twenty cricket, right? Everyone's wants a shrunken slinger. Everyone wants a you know to know who our new mystery spinner is, right? But with Test cricket, and it's and I think we're making it almost specifically a shrunken issue when actually it's not. It's a, it's a global issue, and if we take our emotions out of it. I mean, I don't want Ireland to come over to, to Schlunk and get smashed to pieces in, inside three days. I don't, you know, I, I don't think it's it's good for anyone that every, every Schlunk player could add 30 onto their average after, you know, a two-match series against Ireland. I, I, you know, I think the kind of Afghanistan is slightly more competitive, but there's not much in you know between you know when does Zimbabwe even ever play Test cricket? Right, the whole system yeah, is rigged. Basically. Yeah, yeah, the whole system is so rigged against us and against the other teams around us. And you know we the women have played one Test, and there's just no hope of them ever playing another Test match. Right, I just think at some point you just got to go. What are we fighting for? This sentimentality, right, um, around it. When actually, let's just put all our resources into trying to produce, you know, do, our, our kids in Colombo, our kids in Candy, our kids in Gaul, our kids in Jaffna, are they growing up wanting to play test cricket? Or are they growing up now wanting to play in the IPL or wanting to play in the LPL or wanting to play in, in the Nepal Super League uh, and the Canadian Global <laughs> T20 League? Um, or, or do they, dream, you know, do they dream of scoring just centuries at Old Trafford, right? There was a time when Shrunk had, a, uh, they had really good test players when we were coming to England every kind of two or three years, we're going to come. They're coming to England this summer for the first time in eight years. Like it's 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 like why are we constantly fighting for this? Like, but isn't that existing Sri Lanka for every other team in the world? Stop playing it. St Peter's will still play St Joseph's. Like there'll still be big matches all over the island. The kids will still play three day games. But the, this this one format isn't working. I think what the like really the only hope for it is is that the IPL owners get together and go. Do you know what we're going to start a five day league? Can you imagine if we have if we if we had Chennai Super Kings playing the Mumbai Indians for five straight days? Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, how much money would Sony give us? <laughs> like, uh, it'd be, be bigger than the Avengers. Um, that is the only hope for it, right? Because nobody like they all sit in the room and none of, no one has any ideas. You, you know what's what what's so fascinating is the cha- how the discourse changes from the lead up to the series to when the series is actually pr- played. When Test cricket is actually played, everyone loves it, right? Everyone's like, "Oh, this is why we need to save Test cricket." And then there's these, you know, people in a room saying, "Oh, I don't know how we save Test cricket. I don't know how we save Test cricket." And the product and the problem are two very, very different things. It's not that test cricket isn't an exciting thing. It's not that it's not watchable. It's just that it has been so poorly mismanaged and abused, right? As as you said, Mark, Eric, that it has become, they've made it unprofitable. They've made it a product that so many people love watching that's so admired, something that people don't care about. It's... You know, and, 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 You've totally right. hit the nail on the head, Tom, because the minute yeah. that series starts, I mean, that's going to be the highlight of my summer, right? Yeah. Um, spending days and days in Manchester with Nick, watching uh, Sh- Sri Lanka beat England. I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. But I just think it's just like that constant fight. It's like, why is it any time anything, anything Sri Lanka ever needs, it's got to be a massive fight? Why can't, like, a str- like Sri Lanka, I, th- I think they've played once at Boxing Day at the MCG. And Melbourne's basically in Sri Lankan City, yeah. right? They could definitely yeah. sell out the MCG if they w- if they wanted to, but we're not a big side, so we won't get it. Um, it's you know, Mark. I the think the whole thing. I'm just I'm just done with it. Sorry. <laughs> no, no. I was just gonna say, you know, I, I um, Peter Delapena made this point that 
or no, no, it was it was John Boy, that other the other American cricket guy um was making the good the point, one. Oh yeah, the good one. Yeah. Was making the point that uh you know people watch golf tournaments for four days, right? And if you can market and sell golf to people for four days, you can absolutely market and sell test cricket to people for five days. It's just it's unimaginative, backward, and fundamentally, you know, non egalitarian, right? It's like we want these certain games to be played. We want these certain matches to be played. And then everything else is just optional, effectively. Uh, yeah, I, I just think ultimately what it boils down to, and so I'm ranting now, is that there is the there is a people who run cricket, key gatekeepers in, in key parts of this game, do not want this sport to succeed. <clears throat> they are happy with the lot that they've got, and they don't want this sport to succeed. When I was a kid... I grew up, and, and Dom spent part of his early life in West London, and the, the closest football team to us were Brentford. And when I was a kid, at one point, they got their finances got so bad, the players and the managers used to come and collect money outside the tube stations to be able to keep the club afloat. Kind of 20 years later, they're in the Premier League, and they're absolutely thriving. And you go all around the world, you just say the word Brentford, and people know that they beat Man United for one, one of the greatest days in, in their history, in all of football history in many ways. Um and I'm like, if Brentford can go from being a club that is barely surviving to thriving and becoming an international sports brand, then there's absolutely every chance on this planet that cricket can and test cricket can, except that like the reality is there's too many people who just don't want that to happen. I don't know if they're just not if they like have malintent for the game and like don't want the game to succeed deliberately, or if they're just not capable enough performers to to be able to create a situation where the game can thrive. I'd probably think the latter, but, uh, you know, you, you, it's just so it's just so difficult. And that's why I'm like, if you're shrunken cricket, just jettison it. Like, it's really nice. We all love it. But the reality is we're never going to be able to build a team again. Uh, this could well be our last ever good kind of crop of test players because you might be in a situation in three or four years' time where we're playing like two or three tests a but yeah, if if nothing changes, and then it was basically just the exhibition games. Nick, can you say something positive about it? Because I don't want to end on such. A I I agree with a lot of what you've said, Marky, but I think it is down to the system and the. You can't just shrug your shoulders and say, oh, we're not getting any good games, so we'll just give up. You've got to fight the power. You've got to protest. Yeah. And I mean, like the whole of Test Cricket's in a problematic state, right? Because England is the only country in the world where people buy tickets and go and watch in the stands. And where Test Cricket is an event that people want to travel and go to. But I think around the world... Australia, still, Australia as well. That does happen in Australia yeah, as well. To a, but to a slightly lesser extent, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think around the world, you know, okay, India might not sell loads of tickets to tests, but everyone's following the test while it's on. Um, I think you've just got to accept the test cricket maybe isn't going to pack out stadiums the whole world over five consecutive days. Uh, and there's got to be a different thinking about the way it's marketed about how we can breathe life into it. I heard someone come up with a proposal for a kind of eight team tournament across the course of an English summer. I think something like that's a great idea to just bring a bit of pizzazz into it. Cause the world mm. test championship hasn't really done that, but mm. I just think like, from my perspective, and I know that I've grown up in a different age, so I'm coming at it, and that now T20 is like what everyone wants to watch. But say you get to Lord's cloudy Thursday morning, Vishwa Fernando steams in and picks up five wickets. How exciting is that going to be? How much is that going to mean to Sri Lanka? Like, can that kind of event be mimicked in a 40-over cricket match? Like, I still don't think so. I still think that you... Test cricket is the purest form of the game. It's the greatest drama. And Sri Lanka have produced some of the most incredible characters to grace cricket. And like we can't just um, say, oh, no, we're, we're out. I think we've got to fight for Sri Lanka's test future because I think they're more wonderful days to come. I think that maybe the way forward is you just give the whole of test cricket to like someone like Elon Musk to run. 
No. <laughs> I mean, like, you know, he's, he's talked about his love of cricket before, hasn't he? He loves cricket. And I, thought you were, I, I thought you were going to say give it to Nick to run. <laughs> well, you can give it to Nick to run. But I think, I think like, basically, I'm kind of thinking, like, the one sport that's kind of resurrected itself, right, is Formula One. Yeah. So that was like, basically no one watching, no one cares about it. No one can tell you any of the drivers apart from Lewis Hamilton because he's the best ever. Um, and then they kind of end up with this Netflix show after it gets taken over by private equity in America. And then it's just create this whole new audience for it. You kind of couldn't do a, well, you couldn't do a Netflix show the way that Drive to Survive is made because there isn't that aspect of being on that kind of continuing global circus, right? And the players aren't all in it together. You'd end up with shows like The Test, which I think I've now referenced about four times on <laughs> this podcast, um, which are quite good and do get the drama of it across. Um, and also go some way to humanise the Aussie players, which again I have mixed feelings about. Um, but they need it needs something, right? I saw one of the articles I read said it needs to kind of look at the NFL type model. But I mean, the NFL is just like I don't know the rules of American football. But I find it really like it just feels exciting. It feels like it wants people to watch it. It's doing everything it can to grab your attention. Where I just feel there's too much around Test cricket, which is trying to stop people watching it and inhibiting people from doing it we should you know what we should do we should have a big debate about this we should get other other fans or you know podcasters from other different nations and other people's come on and we should kind of you know thrash it out a little bit and be like what is your beef what is your individual country's beef with test cricket why is it not working for you and what how do we need to fix it um because I don't normally ever advocate private equity coming into things, but <laughs> I think it might be the only way to save it. I don't know. Guys, should we leave it there for today? Because we've been blabbering on for an over an hour. If you got this far in, A, leave us comments, B, subscribe, and C, tell all your friends and family about the Marillion. Because I like Test Cricket, we aren't going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> See you all later. Bye.